Go ahead. Come on. All right. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Bible class number eight in our series on, what's the title of this group? By the Numbers. Uh, yeah, well, today is By the Numbers, but our journey through the wilderness, wilderness wanderings. And uh, today is the uh, number eight on the numbers in the book of Numbers and elsewhere. So let us begin. Um, let me read part of the hymn. Come ye faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God has brought his Israel into joy from sadness. Loosed from Pharaoh's bitter yoke, Jacob's sons and daughters led them with unmoistened foot through the Red, Red Sea waters. Now that's interesting. Led them, led them with unmoistened foot. Whew. Holy cow. Uh, Tis the spring of souls today, Christ has burst his prison, and from three days sleep in death as a sun has risen. All the winter of our sins, long and dark is flying, from his light to whom is given, laud and praise undying. Let's skip down to the last two. For today among his own, Christ appeared, bestowing his deep peace, which evermore passes human knowing. Neither could the gates of death, nor the tomb's dark portal, nor the watchers, nor the seal hold him as a mortal. Join me, everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah, now we cry to our King immortal, who triumphant burst the bars of the tomb's dark portal. Come, you faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God has brought his Israel into joy and sadness. All right, this side of the room, would you please read the prayer from Eve over? Go ahead. Blessed Lord, you brought your people Israel up to the very last years of their wilderness wandering by a mighty and outstretched arm. Break and hinder Amen. All right. If you want to, you can turn to Numbers chapters 1 and 2, although we're not going to take the time. It's 1 and 2 and then 26. Let's go to Numbers 1 and 2. Getting to know these books a little bit. Um, you'll see in Numbers 1 especially, you have the count. Uh, well, let's just go through this, okay? So census figures and numerology. Compare the three senses, censuses, oh, let's say sensi, all right? Uh, how did they change from one to another? The first census was in Exodus, and that was when they were in front of Mount Sinai. And they de did a census to do what? Collect money. Collect money, no, not taxes, but to have an offering for the tabernacle. So they could build and make the tabernacle, okay? The second census we have here in Numbers chapters 1 and 2, and if you looked at that, you'll see how that works. Uh, what was the purpose of this, probably the main census? To get the members of the army. You betcha. To notice who was counted, which, which men? Those 20 years and older who were able to serve in the military, yes, all right, um, as they entered the promised land. And the third one comes later on, I'm not sure where that is, but that was a new generation <coughs> as they moved into the land to inherit it, okay? And, and by the way, what was the, what was the, the age was 20, okay? Uh, how many were there in this census? Anybody add it up? 603,000 men. You add that to the women and the children, and there are probably more women than men, if, if, and then plus children, 
So you're looking at how many people? Well, no, you're looking at two, two plus million people. Okay? Yeah, probably. Um, and um, who was the tribe with the largest amount of fighting men? It's, it makes sense once you uh, know that. No. Judah. 74,600 fighting men. All right, let's go to question two and three. What about the Levites? Why were they excluded? Yeah, they were in charge of the temple. They were not going to be part of the fighting force, nor were they going to inherit any land, okay? Uh, and they were, what was the age breakdown for the counting of the Levites? I thought this was interesting. All males, how old? One month old, yes, not 20. And there were only 22,000 of them. So the tribe of Levi probably was the smallest tribe of the 12. Now let's go to question three. So if we got rid of the tribe of Levi, there's no inheritance. Well, we didn't get rid of them. How do we still maintain 12 tribes? Anybody? Who are they? You're right. It's Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Yes. So they stayed with the number 12, okay? Let's talk about the number 12. Why is 12 important in the, in the Bible? I would say that's seven. But well, we can argue about that, but I would say that's seven. What's the symbol symbolism of the number twelve? Oh, come on! You have the twelve. You have the tw you have the twelve tribes of Israel. You have the twelve apostles. So what? And then in the Book of Revelation, you have one hundred forty-four thousand. What's that? Times times a thousand. Yes. So the number twelve. Take a guess. Gerald Kropke, what's the number 12 a symbolic for in the Bible? Old and New Covenant. No. What? Good, good, good answer. The Holy Christian Church or the Old Testament Covenant and the New Testament Covenant. It's God's people. Yes, the family of God. And they're symbolic. Okay, obviously there were more than, by the way, there were more than 12 apostles. Right? St. Paul was one. Okay? So, the ap apostles. But anyway, so, uh, j yeah, the number 12. What, what are the other numbers? What are the other important numbers in the scriptures? Three. Three of, let's do three. What's three? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Think about Trinity, the th number three. I, I went online once and looked up the number three. There's something unique about the number three, and I can't remember what it is. Uh, but then you, yeah, you have and the three, the three some, and four is of course four corners of the earth, the east, the, uh, north, south, east, and west. By the way, that's in our in our study for today. The winds, the four. Oh no, maybe that's for my sermon. Maybe that's the sermon. <laughs> Uh, and of course, three plus four equals seven, okay? Uh, let's move on. How are each tribe's camps arranged? Oh yeah, did you read this, uh, how they're arranged? There are four on each, or no, yeah, there's three on each side. So there's the north, south, east, and west. As they're move, which way are they moving, generally? They're moving east. Who is on the center of the east side of the Ark of the Covenant? On, in the center, on the east side of the Ark of the Covenant. It'll make perfect sense once I tell you. No. Judah. It's Judah. Led the way. Okay? Oh, and then it has the question about Jacob. You know, Jacob. Remember when he met his brother Isaac? No, not Jacob. Esau. Esau was coming with his fighting men. Remember that? And Jacob remembered he cheated his brother. Right? Okay. So what did old Jacob do? He had all these women and children, and you know, remember that? He sends a group out. Don't you remember that? He sends a group out, and then another group, and finally he shows up. What a guy! Oh my gosh, isn't that something? Oh my gosh, 
Yeah, he sends out, by the way, he sends out, who did, I have that written down here somewhere. Where is that? Yes, the, uh, the slave women, yes. Uh, Zilpah and Be Belha, okay? Then he sends out Leah, and last of all, he comes with Rachel and Joseph, okay? What a guy, what a guy. All right, uh, Judah, okay. Uh, the, oh, yes, let's talk about Judah, question five. How does Judah's role uh, point toward the Christ? That's kind of, anyway, anybody? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 49, the blessing, the scepter will not depart from Judah, okay? Judah was the one through whom the Messiah would come. Everybody understand that? All right, let's go on. Oh, day, let me know what I want to say. Day one, let me see what I got written down here. Uh, yeah, um, oh, by the way, they left. Uh, Israel left the promised land and went to Egypt with how many people? Genesis chapter 46. How many people? Don't look it up. Don't you remember? 70. And just think, they left, they, they went from Palestine to Egypt. Remember that? Joseph, uh, Israel took to family and moved to where, where uh, Joseph was. And they were there for how long? Well, at least, probably four to five hundred years. And they left there with two, over two million people. Now, I don't know about, I haven't done the math, but is that about accurate to go from 70? But I think it says in the scriptures that the Lord blessed them and that they had a lot of children. Is well, that not true? Had to be men and women. Yes, it was. So, yeah. Only the women. Right. So, so there had to be an exponential growth over the course of those Many years. Children yeah. Have so, five. yeah. We just, you know, yeah. All right. What else? The Exodus, the atonement money, okay. Um, oh, yes. The last census is in Numbers 26, and that was the new generation. Okay, we're going to come back to the new generation. Were they any different than the old? No. They were probably, well, who knows. All right, let's go to day two. Korah and the Aaron staff. Uh, do you guys remember this story? I don't remember this story. I had to reread it. Korah, of course, was a member of the Le Levites, and he wasn't happy with Moses and Aaron because, yes, it says, you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly. They were lording, you are lording it over us, okay? So Korah and 250 of his cohorts made, made, made a big stink about Moses and Aaron, Let's go to question seven. How did Moses respond? Yes, they did. He didn't get angry, uh, but, um, and then if you go into this, whatever, Numbers, oh yeah, I wanna, the, the plague. In Numbers chapter 16, God sends a plague on Israel because of their disobedience <laughs> to um, I don't know, no, not the snakes. It's, this isn't the snakes. This is a different plague. I don't think we're told what it is. It's in Numbers chapter 16. The plague started, and Moses and Aaron, or Aaron offers a sacrifice to stop the plague. You know how many died from that plague? 14,000, it says. Okay? So God, they turned it over to God. Let's go on. What is the significance of the budding staff? Well, there were, each tribe had a staff, right? A shepherd's staff. And they were all together in the Ark of the Covenant, okay, or around the Ark, and only one budded. That was Aaron's. What was that sign? God was using him and blessing him, so Aaron was the representative to God, okay? Uh, Aaron's appointment, yes, Aaron's appointment. Uh, and the point of all this is, Ministry is established by the Lord. Okay, let's go to questions 9 and 10. I want to have a discussion. 
What are the responsibilities of a Christian congregation laity of their pastor? Anybody? Okay. Anybody else? You must have been raised in the Lutheran Church. Okay, so uh, let's talk about that. Uh, the God's people, the laity. Um, wh what's the difference among the laity and God and the pastor? Daryl Kropke, you were raised in the Lutheran Church. What's the difference? I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Well, the people obviously are to be a part of the ministry, right? It's not like they're the spectators, correct? They are to pray, they are to serve, they are to worship, they are to support, right? It's not like, you know, the pastor does everything and we're, we just come, correct? All right, yes, okay, we just come, all right, so... Um, Let's go on to this. The pastor, of course, is the laborer who serves, who's his primary employer? Well, it's kind of two, uh, two way of uh, twoism, isn't it? Because number one, the pastor is to be serving the Lord, but also he serves the congregation, okay? So it's a both and, not an either or. Uh, the pastor is the laborer for Christ, and his job is to monitor, yes, doctrine and practice, behavior, correct? All right. Uh, let's go down to a question. If you were to experience a time of conflict between a congregation and a pa pastor, how would you respond, and to what scripture passages would you go? So let me ask this question. How many have you lived in a church that had, uh, I don't want to say a lot of conflict, but it was pretty pretty substantial? Penny, you did? Did you guys? Yeah. Oh, well, you're going way back. Okay. I don't know much of that. Anybody else? You did? Nobody else. Okay. Never had any conflict in Minnesota or where did you come from? Michigan. What about you two over there? Where? Or did you have some? Okay. Um, Marlene? Where? Oh, where? Oh, okay. Um, how did it settle? How did, how, if you, as you remember the conflict, how did it settle? <laughs> who's he? Who's he? Who, who's, who, who would they take? Oh, the pastor, okay. They got rid of the pastor. Yeah. Anybody else? Penny? My pastor was thrown out of the church. He was? Yes. Why? Because of the things that he did to one of the women that he did in the oh. church. Oh. Okay. Okay, 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 I understand that. Uh, what else? Lot, yeah, pastor. Uh, in, in, yeah, let's leave that. Let's leave. He uh, left the district. I wonder whatever happened. I don't know what happened to him. I should have looked that up. Anybody else? Pastors move on, right? Uh, sometimes lay people need to move on, correct? Um, I remember in this congregation, uh, it wasn't during my time, but it was in, uh, during the previous pastor. And there was some, a family here that raised, uh, I don't remember who it was, but the elders got together and they went and visited them. Yeah, they went and visited. I thought that was good, you know? And, uh, and finally, the family just walked away, moved on, which, you know, it happens. It's too bad. Uh, the best thing would be, what would be the best thing? <laughs> How about give them a gun, put them back, put them back to back and let them walk their faces? Um, well, the best thing is for reconciliation, correct? And you got to be careful about that. When I was circuit counselor, I dealt with a lot of conflicted churches. And let me, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have kept my mouth shut. But let me just tell you, preachers have a problem, okay? 
And part of the problem is arrogance. They can think too much. But also people, laity, can have arrogance and a problem. It's a both and. It's not a one-way street. I, I want to say to you that the relationship between ch a church and the pastor is one of marriage. It's a marriage relationship. It's a give and take, yes. And everybody has their responsibility. And the point is we work together for the good of the kingdom of God. It's not my way versus your way. It's our way together. Correct? Yes. And we got to be careful about that. And some pastors haven't learned that. Uh, you guys aren't aware of this. But there are places in the Midwest where pastors have come in. Oh, yeah, and I don't want to, we've got family that went through this. They changed everything and they did, it was their way or the highway. And you got to be careful. And, oh, and it, it became very divisive, you know, and little stuff. So let me just say to you, there, there, the focus has to be on ministry. When there's conflict in the church, what happens to the ministry? It falls, there is no, yeah, because all of the energy is toward the conflict. So the best thing is for peace to be made, and sometimes one of the ways, if peace can be made, one of the ways is for people to move on, and that can be lay people or it can be clergy, okay? Pastor, I had an experience when I moved to Oregon. It took me conflict two and a half years to find a church, literally, to find a church that was acceptable to me, and one that I found, which is a very large church, they averaged 285 to 300 mm -hmm. per service. Their pastor, who had been there for decades, since the time of Christ, almost, <laughs> retired, and of course, yes. with that came a young whippersnapper sure. kind of guy, and the first thing he did, mm -hmm. he brought in a female assistant pastor. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, that wasn't a wise thing. That probably was not no, a wise thing. The young pastor who was, I mean, quite young, it was his second mm -hmm. church, not his first. Yeah. Um, didn't allow himself time to transition before he started mm -hmm. making what the congregation sure. viewed as yeah. massive change. Yeah. And that's difficult. I think change is one of those big things can put a chink in the armor, so to speak, and cause that kind of conflict. I mean, it took them months. Yeah, and that's why you have to work together for change. You, you, have your, you work together. It's not coming down from the top. The pastor can guide and lead, but you got to work together. You know, you know, it's, anyway. Yes, Eve. That's that. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with you. I think that's a huge part. You're right. Not dictatorial, but loving. Yeah. He may be an idiot, but we love him. He's he's he may but he may be a, but he's our idiot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He uh, yeah. No, you're right, Eve. Thank you. And it goes the other way too. For the pastor to sense the love of the people, you know, that's huge too. And I don't know if congregations always understand that. All right, let's move on. Day three. I'd like to go back to your question, Tim, because you missed a big part of it. Number scripture passages and resources in the church. Yes, okay. Okay, so if I had Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew 18, it talks about how you resolve it. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh huh. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, you don't want a contentious person on the board of elders. Nor do you want somebody who wants to pay back. 
But well, there's a whole bunch of others too. There's First Corinthians. I didn't write. I didn't mention them. I should have. First Corinthians 12, Ephesians 6, Philippians 2 and 4. There's a lot of guidelines uh, on uh, scripture passages for this. So, all right, we're moving on. Yes. When, when these young pastors read set Numbers out 30. For their, for their careers, aren't they schooled on what to expect or what not to do and what? To yes. Do? Well, they are, of course. Are There's well. Oh, hang on a minute. There is there are classes on pastoral pastoral care. Let me use that term. Okay, how you deal with people. Okay, um, and yes, and then there there's a vicarage year where they're out on a year for vicarage, so they're put in there. Some vicarages are good, and some are lousy. You know, they don't do anything. Yeah, they don't. Vicarage should be a time where you're the idiot. And the congregation tells you everything you're doing wrong. Like an internship. <laughs> yeah, like an internship. Right. Yes, yeah. And some some vicarages are not very good. And uh, but and some get it. Some preachers are hard hard headed. Let me just well, say that. To yes, it can be. Yes, yes. And if and when you think you know better than all, you're 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 probably the biggest idiot. Okay, all right. Plus, it's the mentor too that they have. You know, some of some some of them didn't have much of. Let's, let's a mentor. Let's move on. Moses denied entry. This is an amazing thing to me. Uh, <coughs> Deuteronomy thirty-one and thirty-four. Uh, let's just go through this. Here you go. Here's a second time where Israel grumbles. It's not the first time. Probably it's not the second time. But again, they're crabbing about what? The lack of water, all right? So God tells him, uh, God tells him to um, speak to the rock, and Moses, in his frustration, strikes the rock, not once, but twice, <laughs> okay? Um, I don't, I'm not sure Moses knew what he was doing. Maybe he just had a senior moment Huh? Maybe he had a senior moment or whatever, but he disobeyed God, and that made God angry, okay? Um, but again, the people doubted God's ability to provide. And the numbers, in Numbers 20, that's the new generation. That's not the old folks that were there before, but now the new generation of complainers. In, yeah, don't you like that? A new, ge a new generation of complainers in Numbers 20. And I want us to go to Deuteronomy 31. Would you, would you, would you do me a thing? Deuteronomy 31. Yeah, 31. Thir Deuteronomy 31, verses 14. Israel's rebellion predicted. Now this is where uh, Joshua, if you look at the beginning of chapter 31, Joshua is going to uh, succeed Moses. Everybody see that? His death is coming a couple now. Go to verse 14. Israel's rebellion predicted. I don't ever remember this. The Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. Moses probably said, thank you, Lord. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came, presented themselves at the tent of meeting. You know, that was quite the moment, the young guy and the old guy. The Lord appeared at the tent of meeting in a pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood over the entrance to the tent. The Lord said to Moses, You are going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. On that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and difficulties will come upon them. And on that day, they will ask, have not these disasters come upon us because 
Our God is not with us. And I will certainly hide my face on that day because of their wickedness in turning to other gods. Now just think about that, people. What did Israel think that God turned his, he wasn't with them? Not because of their sin, but because he turned away. And God turns away because they go after other gods. Now just think about that. And God knew this, obviously. And he says it to Moses. And and he knew this, but yet he led the Israelites across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And if you know anything about the future history of the kings uh, under David and all those leading up to David and uh, the Babylonian captivity, remember that whole history? Why didn't God just get rid of them? And start over. But he, cho- he fulfilled his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God was long-suffering and lived with those people. And we in the Christian faith need to learn that. And I think generally, in my opinion, not all, but there, I'm sure there are, I know there are sections, that we too need to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. And once we start prostituting ourselves, if you will, toward other gods or other non-godly ways, we're in for deep trouble. Okay? And by the way, um, I want you to go online and look up, what's the name of that that new uh, Christianity? Progressive Christianity. No, write it down, folks. And go online. I looked it up. Daryl, you go online, don't you? Write it down. Progressive Christianity. Hang on a minute. Progressive Christianity. Go online and look it up. And yeah, that's scary, folks. You'll, some of it is very scary. What? I don't know if it is coming out of Germany. I don't, I, don't, well, I don't know that. I don't know that. But it seems like all of Missouri leaves the center and leaves Germany. I mean, that was probably the best move that, that anybody ever made. Otherwise, you know, we would have been all polluted by Probably, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, when I was back in Wittenberg, it was bad news for us. Was it? Yeah, I mean, it, there was no good thing going on. Really? Yeah, who was I visiting with? They're turning the churches in Europe to restaurants and mosques. And mosques, yeah. The, the, anyway, so anyway, just, just think about this, though. What God went through, and he labored with those people. Not that there weren't faithful ones, but, you know, and, you know, you come to the time of Christ, and you have somewhat of the same thing. And, but then you have the faithful Jews, like Mary and Joseph, and their families and other families, you know, that were faithful, devout Jews. But a lot of it was corrupt. And we've got to guard against that in the church. And let me just say this. We have, the great thing we have to guard against in the church, which I think many people, it has become this way, we have to guard against it being ritual, habitual with sentimentalism, not faith, and not a love for the Lord Jesus. Um, you know, as, we go, as I go through Mark, I love Mark, by the way. I'm not, I don't remember preaching on him much. But one of the great dangers that we have in the church is that it becomes ritualistic. Yeah, we just do it. And there isn't this living, personal, struggling relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ of faith. And faith, by the way, faith isn't perfect and faith isn't easy. You know, that's, it's, it's a struggle. And if you think your faith has reached the perfect perfection level, you're in big trouble. Well, why don't we do, do things to pray? I mean, I, yeah. Gideon, I go to all these different churches. I mean, the Lutheran church is probably the worst. What do you in, think 
Yeah, that's true. When you talk about roads, people might think about what they're doing. You didn't say prayers that are in the hymnal. Well, I, in confirmation, we taught kids to pray. How many of you were taught to pray? I was taught to pray. Where you learn to pray. Yeah, well, and, but maybe I'm missing the point. What's the point I'm missing? Can you pray on your own? Out loud? I do. I try. I do. Like every day. Okay. Okay. All right, we're moving on. Now that we've settled that. Joshua. Oh, good old Joshua. By the way, what's the great phrase that God says to Joshua? And then God says it, and I think Moses says it too. Be strong and courageous. Oh yeah, that's in the book of Joshua. It, it, I, I got, should do a sermon on that. How many times is Joshua told to be strong and courageous? All right. Yes, it is. Yeah, be strong and courageous. What is communicated in the ceremony of the laying on of hands? And how do we use it today? Laying on of hands. Where do we do, where do we lay our hands on? Confirmation, Confirmation Yes. And, that, and I like having the parents come up and the family putting their hand. We never used to do that. Uh, confirmation, um, absolution. We don't do that in public worship, but in private, private confession and absolution, I remember putting my hands on someone and giving the, the word of absolution, okay? Uh, the other one, of course, is ordination and installation, okay? The blessing... The, uh, give me another example where we put a hand of blessing. Healing prayer, yes. You put your hands on there. and there, By the way, and if you look at Jesus' ministry, that's, he, he did a lot of that with people. We've got to be careful about that, okay? But on the other hand, uh, the, the value of touch is very important, isn't it? Okay, yes. Well, yeah, I, I did that last week. Was it what, what, what week was that where I went to two places and they both died? <laughs> no, I did. I went both places. They had both passed away. That, yeah, I went. Yes, I went to, yeah, Carmen's. Yes, I did. The whole family was gathered around the bed. She was not conscious. And I, we prayed. And I think I prayed for the Lord to take her quickly. And, uh, yeah. And he did. Got to be careful when the pastor comes. Your healing services. Yes, we should resurrect those. Yes. Yeah, we should resurrect those. Yes, but healing. I've had people say in prayer, you know, like in a, in a well, in those services, but also in the hospital, and they, they, they felt there was a, not just an emotional, but yeah, they felt the power. All right, let's move on. We're going to day four, Hezekiah. Oh yeah, this one. What notes do I have? Day three, I read Deuteronomy, speak to the rock, and poor old Moses, he didn't get to go in. Probably was happy, you know, I don't know. I think he had enough. I, you know, you know, the bronze serpent. Uh, did we do the bronze serpent? Not, or, yeah. or we're coming to the bronze serpent, okay. The bronze serpent. Uh, this, of course, was Israel again complained Okay, uh, this was for lack of food and water, right? So, and the, God, got, God got angry. So a bunch of them died. So he had Moses put a bronze serpent up on a, on, a, on a stick. And if they looked at it, they would be healed. All right. So uh, the whole point of this is, I go down to question 18, read John 3. By the way, this comes after while Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Remember that? As the Lord, so the Lord, so the Lord as will be lifted up. But what was required of the people? You had to have what? You had to have faith to actually look at the bronze snake, right? And the same thing is true. You actually have to have faith 
to look at the cross of Christ and to trust in him and the salvation. You know, and that's the great tragedy for so many that, you know, the, the, it, the grace of God is there and available. But if you don't look at it and receive it, it does you no good. You know, that's like being sick and you don't take the pill and you die and, and the same is true of the grace of God and how many people disavow that grace. They just push it aside and they don't need it. You know, think of that great tragedy. And that, that to me, that's sad. I mean, that, that's that sin against the Holy Spirit is the rejection of the grace of God and that faith. We're not saved by faith. We're saved by grace. A big difference. Faith is, is, you know, we're saved by grace. By the way, Sunday I'm preaching on this, the, the fellow idiots. Let me call them that. Our fellow idiots. The apostles in the boat. Our fellow idiots. I'm preaching on Jesus in the boat. You know, he's sleeping in the back. You got to love the comedy of Jesus. You just really do. You just have to love, love the whole thing. And they're scared to death, and they say, don't you care if we die? Well, yeah. And then Jesus you know, responds, and they're filled with awe. Who is this guy? But we say the same thing. You know, it's not faith or fear. It's faith and fear, Right? I mean, I'm going to, I believe that on my deathbed, I probably am, am going to have some fear. No? You absolutely. Because my faith is not complete, it is not full, and I am filled with fear, you know? And, you know, and thank God he puts up with us. He knows that. I know. Yeah, he knows that. Yeah. And, you know... <sighs> And our parents knew it too, right? I mean, think of how many times our parents put up with us. Oh no, okay, I should take that back. My parents, they, they didn't have to put up with anything with me. And I'm sure none of your parents had any difficult children. Yes? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's fear, a lot of fear. Yeah. You know, because, because let's face it. We want God to do what we want him to do. He's supposed to do what I want. Right, Daddy? You didn't do what I want, Mommy. You know, I want to do this. Aren't you glad you didn't kill your children? Huh? He came close a few times, yeah. Let's go to question 19. Here's Hezekiah. I did not know this. Hezekiah destroyed the bronze serpent. 700 years later, you know why? Huh? Yeah, they turned it into a um, an object of worship. Yes. Now, let's have a discussion on this, people. Uh, this shows up, by the way, in, our, in the formula of Concord, in the book of Concord, about old practices of worshiping items. Well, not so much idols, well, they, they are, but items that will help me be healed. Anybody remember that from your past? It's still common in the Roman church today to for a lot of people that if I can touch this holy thing that will have some benefit, some healing in my life. And you know, I, 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 love, I love the brothers and sisters in the Roman church, but a lot of it is you know, it is in it's fear, but it's in those things, and and instead of praying to the Lord, yeah, and, and you know, and uh, by the way, the what, 500 years ago when we came out of the Roman Church, that was recognized that people would go back to those things, you know, that was their source of assurance. For us, in in 500 years later, we don't have that so much, but uh, yeah, tough. Heard that displayed that stuff, meaning the language, 
Yeah, we thought if we were to talk space, it would work with us to get the email. So I was so astonished when I did this mission church for the first time. I heard about grace and love. I said, oh, Lord, I'm here. I'm home. I'm going to stay here, and I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, and good works are necessary. But they are they don't save us, yes. They are a necessary byproduct. All right, let's move on. And by the way, Luther had a problem with that. Everybody left the Catholic Church five hundred years ago, and they say, the heck with this. We're saved by grace, we can do whatever the heck we want. Don't you remember that? Yeah, and Luther went crazy because they were out doing whatever and uh shows how good we are as human beings, doesn't it? We're just wonderful. God's lucky to have us, isn't he? He's lucky to have us. All right, the wilderness battles and what else? Talking to donkeys. <laughs> There's a story there somewhere. Uh, okay, so the kingdoms of Sion, Og and Sion. These were kings on the east side of the Jordan as they were moving, and Israel was coming to inhabited land. Okay, they had been in the wilderness. Everybody understand that? So now, um, uh, I have this written down somewhere. Where is this? So the two kings, they would not let Israel pass. You know why? Because they were so numerous. And instead of the kings having the wisdom to say, yes, you can pass, okay? And Israel said, we're not going to destroy your land. We'll just pass through, okay? Okay. Instead of that, they waged war against that, and then their land was destroyed. It, it show, shows something, yes. And then we come, to, I, don't want, I want to talk about Balak, question 23 and following. This is an amazing story, isn't it? Where the king Balak of Moab, isn't he the king of Moab? He hires this Balaam, who was a prophet, and he, call, he hires him to curse Israel. Balaam, of course, had a, had a donkey who traveled with him, all right? You got to read this, folks. Uh, Moab was terrified of Israel because of so many, so many people. So Balak hires Balaam to curse Israel, and Balaam is out journeying with his donkey, and the angel of the Lord stops them in the road. Okay, if you've read this. Okay, and the donkey understands what's going on, but Balaam didn't so much, did he? So finally, they figure it out. And, and why can't Balaam curse Israel? Because the Lord forbid him to do so, and Balaam knew that, okay? So uh, Balaam, we refer to that as Balaam's ass. That guy, and he, un he understood he was smarter than Balaam, Okay? Uh, the angel of the Lord addresses uh, the donkey and Balaam, if I remember. Uh, but here is, an, in question 25, this whole issue that Debbie brought up last week, and that was about the pre-existent Christ appearing uh, in human form or in some form. Okay, uh, That was with uh, Abraham, with Isaac. Remember the angel of the Lord stopped him. Uh, Moses at the burning bush, um, and there are a number, a number of other ones. Interesting stuff. Okay, so next week is our last session, and uh, I'm not sure exactly. Anybody know what it's on? Yeah, uno momento. And what's it on? Planning to settle. Planning to settle. Yeah, it's probably just before they move into the disposition of the land. I uh, may not be here with you um, because of uh, our family issue in Wisconsin. My father-in-law is probably, I don't know, he's re rebounding. So uh, if I'm not here, Clifford will be here, okay? So be nice to him. How old is he, Pastor? 90, 90 years old, yes. Yeah? I was going to ask his commentary, why was Did they? Yes. See, I didn't read that far. <laughs> I should have read that far. Did they kill Israel? Kill, kill, where are you? Oh. Oh. 
I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I should have read the whole, what, where is that? Where is that? What chapter? In Numbers? Where is that? Where is that, Ken? I'll, I'll find it. Or, or, or call it in. All right. So, uh, ba- oh, gosh. Israel moving north. All right. Anything else? Uh, we had a, um, the Garza family had a, uh, his father-in-law passed away yesterday? Yesterday. yesterday. Right. So rem- remember them in your prayers. Remember them in your prayers. Was it Monday? Maybe it was Monday. Uh, anything else? The LWML convention is going to be on uh, in Kentucky. Uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Uh, this weekend is Father's Day weekend, correct? And uh, anything? Oh, and it is the U.S. Open Golf Championship weekend. Make sure you watch that, Nadine. Yeah, okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this day. And we thank you, dear Father, for your patience with us as your dear children in this world, dear Lord. Preserve us from being like our ancient ancestors in Israel. Dear Lord, so often we wonder where you are and if you even care about us. Help us to love you, dear Father, to love the one you sent, your Son, Jesus Christ. And dear Holy Spirit, keep working in our hearts. Humble us, humble us over and over again. Preserve us from arrogance and stupidity. Help us to love you, to serve you, and to be a blessing in the lives of those around us. Dear Lord, today we do pray for all those with health issues. Uh, For Gerald Schrader, we pray for him, dear Lord, and and know that so probably soon you're going to take them home, dear Jesus, and that's okay. We pray for the Garza family and others who have lost loved ones recently. And remind us, dear Lord, that our journey, our pilgrimage through this world is only temporary. We look forward to the day when we reach the promised land of eternal life in heaven. <coughs> Until that time, keep us faithful, keep us strong and fill us with joy and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day, everybody. Jesus bless you.